Welcome. Uh, just to understand that you are live and listening, the first question that I, I will not talk so much about Estonia actually today. Uh, so the commercial was a bit sideways, but how much of you here actually care about the user of your system, whatever the system is? How much of you actually care about who the user is? Whose business relies on the fact of you know the identity? Some of you know. Anybody here interested in anybody who is not Lithuanian in their systems? Or everybody is only interested in Lithuanian customers? One hand there. Some others as well, okay. So my, my talk mostly is to those who, whose target as the market is at least Europe. And I'm a little bit discussing also in my uh, next couple of minutes what I think about the Europe uh, as a market for identity and what happens there. And not touching too much about what happens in the world because that would require another hour. Um, but we can discuss that later on. So we, we will discuss European uh, identity. And I'm, I'm very glad that so many people are obsessed about identity. Because that's been my obsession for 20 years. And I will reflect on like last 10 years, maybe. So first of all, what the identity is and what the electronic identity or e-identity is. So very clearly, we associate identity with us somehow without normally explaining to ourselves even what the identity is. So as a biologic biological uh, living being, in less than 10 years, all of the cells of your body have been replaced with new ones. But you still believe that you are the same person in 10 years than you are today. Yeah? So this is somehow uh, the way how we associate ourselves with, uh, with biological, body, biological body. So if DNA remains the same, so it, we, we still are the same. The identity in the real world normally is reflected in a passport. And a passport has about me, my birth date, my uh, personal identity number. My identity in the real world is based on passport having some data about me and you looking at my face, recognizing me on the picture of the passport. And the identity uh, is basically a claim from many government in the world normally. And everything that we have, like loyalty cards, banking cards, everything is based on that. Now, if you take that concept to the digital world, so the digital world is different from a single point of view only because there is no me. So I cannot actually transport myself into bits. I am not in bits anything. So everything that you see in the digital world or the electronic world is calculated and should be calculated. And I, as well as most of you, are very bad calculators. So whatever you calculate in your head, my computer, even my phone, is calculating better than you. So therefore, if you try to out outsmart the technology in calculations and trying to identify yourself through calculations that you do, you will always be beaten by computers. Yeah? Anybody arguing with that concept? No, don't argue, because that's what we have found out already a long time ago. The idea is that we hand out some devices, some gadgets to people to say that, well, this gadget will represent you in the digital world. So the electronic identity is not you, not biological you in any shape or form. It is always some gadget representing you. And the gadget does calculations that normally are unique. And we believe that this gadget cannot be replicated somewhere. So this is the overall concept of the identity. And how do we do that electronically? And the problem with that is that the gadget lives totally different life than you do. So it's very probable that one day the gadget will crash. So it doesn't work anymore. But you will. So your identity lives on independently from that gadget. The other way around as well. You, can, you may lose your gadget to somebody. So the gadget lives on, but you don't want that to be representing you anymore. Make sense? So the electronic identity is all about that. Uh, how to manage those gadgets that are connected to you. And that's what, what is part of our business. The other part of our business uh, uh, on, as electronic identity providers is about signature. And signature is nothing more than connecting people to the data. And normally we do that kind of thing. 
And if I would send you an A4 paper where this is present, the thing there, you wouldn't understand the thing. If I would explain close to that, that okay, this actually is my signature, I did that. There is no way how you can understand what it is. Looking at people's signatures, we, none of us understand that it is their signature in the, in the physical world, which we do trust. So signature in the physical world is quite poor biological uh, identification method. So we, if needed, we go to handwriting expert and they would tell that most probably, the most probably is like 70% probability that is done by that person but maybe like 30% it is copied from somewhere. In this electronic signature form, again, we do something different and we there are able to say who did, what did, when did, and the thing that they did is unchanged from the moment they created that. So this is the electronic identity uh, used in the signature concept. So we try to actually hook the data with a person very strongly and actually explain to anybody reading the signature who did that signature, when did that signature, and so on. So that is something uh, as a concept to be understood. And I will now go switch to the legal environment and the European-wide environment as it is today and what it does today. So very quickly, what is the ADAS? Anybody knows what is the ADAS? One person knows, two people know, none of you know. <laughs> uh, so ADAS is an interesting thing. If you are familiar with the European Union as a concept, then you should know that the European Parliament does two kinds of things. They do directives, and directive is legally an interesting thing. Every member state has to implement that somehow, and mostly every member state implements that differently. And therefore, the directives means that every member state still behaves in a different way than the other. The other thing that the uh, parliament can do is a regulation. And the regulation is a law in any member state. And there is no need for local implementation because it is the implementation. You may a little bit uh, have a role and a local regulation about what some or the other parties do in local member state, but this is a regulation. ADAS is a regulation on electronic identity and trust services. So two things, trust services and electronic identity. And it is a leap that, uh, that Europe did. Uh, and the leap was from a digital signature directive that came from 1999, which did not work until the ADAS came and still wouldn't work in any shape or form, I think. From standards, that didn't exist almost. Uh, and if they did exist, they were not guaranteeing any interoperability. So if I did a signature, if you think about signature digitally, then uh, if I would do a signature in the real world on a wooden plate, on a stone, on a paper, anywhere you would recognize that this is a signature. If I would present you in a digital form some amount of bits claiming that these are my signature bits, you most probably wouldn't recognize that as my signature. True? Uh, there is no kind of difference with these bits and other bits, so therefore there must be an interoperability standards to explain that Lithuanians, Latvians, Estonians, Spanish people, they all understand the signature in the same way in the digital world. So it means that we have to have an interoperability there, which we didn't. And practical implementations, almost none that existed uh, that were usable across the uh, European Union. And leap was to regulation, from directive to regulation, which means that we really lived from the fact that every member state has its implementation and weirdnesses to the place where none of the member states have a chance to make that weirdness. So they must be similar. So the way how the, that area of legal environment is looked from the European perspective is the same in Lithuania, in Poland, in Germany, everywhere. So that is the meaning of the regulation. So it, it must work because it is obligation to a member state directly from the parliament. The other thing that Europe has done and, and has done well, I think, is really worked on the standards. So we now have 
a standard, so you have an understanding of what is the signature, similarly as the signature is understood in UK until the Brexit, and then they have different understanding again. But now we understand them uh, and, and they understand us. And really, Europe has done a lot of implementations, and I will come to some of the implementations uh, that are useful for all of us. And the vision for all of us is uh, that we, in whatever member state, wherever we get this identity, and like we have a passport from many member states, we are able to use that identity in any other member state. Yeah? So if you have anything from UK, you can use that in Lithuania. If you have anything from Lithuania, you can use that in Greece. Anything should work cross borders within the European Union. So that's the identity claim. That's the nice vision. And if you are building any business, so that should be within your vision statement as an understanding of if I do something for Lithuanians here, then it's by essence already working for the Brits and working for the Spanish people, working for Italian. That is already working because I have followed the rules of Lithuania and therefore I have also followed the rules of other countries because we have the same rules. And the same goes for the signature. So if you create a signature here and it is legally binding here in Lithuania, you can take the same signature and go to court in Germany, go to court in Poland, go to court uh, anywhere you want in 27 member states. So that's again a vision that this should be able uh, uh, kind of for anybody to kind of really bring out the business that is cross European and that would be a realization or a small part of this digital single market that we have dreamed of. That we really jump to the digital single market. That we have a service that is usable single, uh, in a single market as a single instance. So we, do, we don't have to have like 27 implementations after the first one. We have one implementation that is scalable. And this is a vision and visions don't come true. So this is good vision. And don't think that this has already happened or will happen anywhere soon. I will go into details about what the uh, real European uh, identity really is. So what is the ADAS regulation saying about the identities? The, and, and here, this is really the first ever international legal framework for identity or, or authentication solutions. So uh, there is nothing in the world that would be similar to that. And uh, as with the first things always, they are not the best ones. So when we tried to do that, we were able to agree in Europe only that we use the same similar things in the public sector. So the regulation is about identity in the public sector, unfortunately. But it still means that uh, Lithuanian public sector services must trust identity coming from Netherlands. And they cannot claim that they don't trust it. There is a member state to kind of uh, round table in Brussels. They come together, they uh, kind of listen that, okay, in Netherlands, they have this kind of nice solution to identify people. Yeah, we agree that this is a high level scheme somewhere and, and everybody goes on uh, living their lives happily. I'll come to that uh, a little bit later. So this is the first part. So I don't know if that uh, was laser. This is laser. So the first part of that is the identification so we talk about identification, so how to identify a person over the electronic channels. And member states claim that they know how to do that. And this is targeted to a, a clearly public sector. The next part is about trust services, which is here. The electronic trust services is all about basically a playground for the business. So anybody in Europe can play in these different services from any member state to any other member state, we all have the same rules of supervision. So we have the same accreditation rules, we have the same certification rules, we have the same rules for the European economy. That means that we trust the services from many member states in any other member state, and that's cool. That is something, again, any other region in the world doesn't have. Like There is no other place in the world where you could say that I build a Lithuanian trust service for, I don't know, time stamping, and I can assume that there are other countries who trust me blindly only because Lithuania did. 
There is nothing like that anywhere else in the world. So we are in a good place in that sense. A uh, little bit going down now to maybe not so positive sides of that is that if we agree on the identity, then we unfortunately agree on three different levels of identity. These three different levels are somehow um, very um, popular in, uh, in Brussels. Now the same levels are applicable for ENISA to bring out the uh, cybersecurity uh, products and, and certify cybersecurity products in the European Union. Like we, have, we don't know what we certify, but we know that they are low, substantial and high level. But in the identity, low and substantial and high level, you see my very short interpretation what they are. And the idea is that if there is a Lithuanian service somewhere that says that as a public service, we allow Lithuanian customers who have the high level tokens to access that service. Maybe a hospital would say that my uh, patient's data is available for a patient based on the high level token. And that would mean that if that is a public sector service, and most of the hospitals are uh, somehow pub uh, publicly related, so then that also means that a German person with a high level token must have access to the same system. Yeah, makes sense? So you have this kind of a obligation. It's not voluntary that they accept it. It is obligation from member state to member state within the public services to accept that. They can deny anything on a substantial or low level, which is okay. If they ban it for Lithuanians on a substantial or low level, they can ban it also for the uh, outsiders. But they cannot ban it simply because they are high level and not Lithuanians. It must be something else. So this is, I think, the rules of the game. Unfortunately, there is no good standard there. There is no kind of real uh, technical stuff that is implementing that as an identity scheme. But there is a very, very good technical stuff allowing any member state to work with an other member state. So there is no like one-to-one -one relationships anymore. It is a common framework which was tested out, I think, starting from 2008 with the Stork project, so like this large-scale project that we did across the European Union in two different projects, and we understood how we can do it. So there is a technical standard implementation even of that standard that now works in every member state. Every member state has its node where they accept others to come in and then explain to others in the European Union how to understand Lithuanians, for example, or Estonians. Yeah, makes sense. So this is what we have achieved with that. We have a common framework in all the member states how to actually identify people. It's very hard to access as a kind of a private sector uh, entity yet, but I think that this is evolving as the uh, ADAS regulation by the statements at least encourages everybody to actually use it also in a private sector. This not yet has not happened, but uh, hopefully it will. Next thing is the quality uh, of signature. Before we go to quality, we have to understand what is a signature and how do we agree in Europe. And I think these guys very well um, kind of explain how we do agree in Europe. In Europe, we discussed for years and years and years what should be the format of the signature, like a format of the signature. How do we understand each other? After long discussions, we understood that there are three formats of the signature. So these are like these. Uh, Xades, Pades, Cades formats. So, so we couldn't agree. The, the, the unfortunate fact is that there is no A format, but there are three formats and all of them are okay. And at least, in, again, at, at least in the public sector again, none of them can be denied. And this is obligation also for Lithuanian public sector. Anybody for a public sec from public sector here? Anybody, no? A couple of people? I would ask from those people, keep your hands up if you are able to identify these formats somehow and understand if the customer or like the citizen of any member state makes a claim based on those signatures. Raise your hand if, if you think that you are able to do that. You are, but you are not public official. Okay, so there has been a success story. 
that person knows a success story in Lithuania about actually accepting some Spanish people's signature in, in Lithuanian public sector. But it actually should be from any country to any country, and this should kind of already be like that for two years. It, and it hasn't been yet. So, but we are slowly, slowly getting there. In every member state, we are hearing the stories like yours. Like they're, they're, every member state is doing small steps towards that, that actually public sector would understand that. But other than like those free formats, I will come with the next slide to a even more horrible stuff. So we have free formats. So you can have like PDF signed, XML signs, and, and CMS is signed. The next thing that I think that none of you well, maybe some of you. You can uh, raise your hand if you make the difference between signature levels. Can you make difference in signature levels? No, I, I thought so. I think that the, the problem is that we have made a law. The, that law I is applicable in 28 countries. Since 2014, it was like taken uh, and, and it was in force starting from 2016. So we have had several years to explain to the whole ecosystem that, guys, we have made a law where we say that the signatures are not all similar signatures, but all of them are kind of okay. And in any member state, I could have this question that do you understand the different levels? And nowhere I, I would see hands. There is a small group of people who are working in the trust services, kind of similar to me. And when we meet, we understand that stuff. And we like to talk about that for hours. But we are not understood by anybody on the market. So it's a pretty uh, lonely place to be. So it is very hard. And, and this is something that we still need to educate the market or teach some of the ideas to say that, OK, we cannot have like three different levels of signatures. Let's have only one, because then people would understand me. because. There are no different levels of my handwritten signature. There is no concept like that. I can only do one kind of kind, one kind of signature. I'm unable to do other kind of signatures. Yeah, and and the same goes here. That it's very hard to understand if I would explain what is the real life uh, comparison to that. But we have that as as a model at least, and we have to currently the obligation of every member state and Brussels uh, as a European centre. Uh, with a commission, I think, as well, to actually educate people that these are the levels and this is what can happen. The only thing that has real life um, parallel is this last one. The qualified signature means that this is a signature that if you create the electronic signature in that level, that this is equal to handwritten signature in any member state. So if you have a law in, in Spain about handwritten signature being kind of required in one procedure, and you do this qualified signature in, in Spain or in Lithuania and present that to Spain, then they have to accept that as on the same level as handwritten signature. This is the best state of art thing. I have 10 minutes. I have 10 minutes, I, I see. <laughs> um, but OK, I will uh, end in five. Not a problem. So what next? The, um, the call to action, so, so what, what to do. So uh, if you are in any member state and you are interested in the pan-European uh, expansion or how understanding on, on the other countries and, and how they identify the people and what kind of people have uh, actually been recognized by, I don't know, Netherlands, Italy or anybody else, then find the local ADAS node. And ADAS node is a keyword here. That is the node that allows public sector to recognize any other public sector in the European Union. So find this place in Lithuania, uh, Poland, Estonia, Latvia, wherever you are from, and ask how you can actually integrate with that, because that would, in essence, give you a, uh, access to the full European market of strongly identified people in the next couple of words. A couple of years, so it's not immediately available. Currently, there are still several countries who haven't notified any identity schemes from their countries, but it is growing uh, on a daily basis almost. And the other thing is that if you are into this kind of a signature part, or you are into getting a consent of somebody, or getting this kind of a understanding that what is the digital data somebody is uh, 
sending you or who is the person sending it to you, then the signatures are now done somewhat in a similar manner across the uh, uh, European Union. I don't, I, know, I don't know how these slides will be uh, divided later on. There is this TSS tool from European Commission. This is a link. You can click on that and then you go there. But if, if it's not, then just search for DSS tool and you'll find it. There is a tool that the Commission has funded that implements all of those digital signature formats, levels, and validates all of them. So you don't have to actually do much other than just implement it in your whatever environment you would have. So this is an existing tool. It is not fantasy. It already works. And it works in several countries, several implementations. And as a last thing, I will do this kind of a very quick introduction of what, uh, what we have gained from that and why do we think that it is important. Smart ID, that is a tool also in Lithuania, has been brought to the market keeping in mind the same kind of ideas that we, we really have done this kind of a, we, we First of all, we do with di di derived identities. We don't identify newborns. We don't kind of understand who are the mothers or fathers. We ask a document and we take the identity from a document from any com uh, country in the European Union. Uh, currently, we are providing that service in three countries, definitely not limited to that in the future. We are recognized at the same time with that uh, tool, thanks to this ADAS, in 28 countries. So we already can say that anything we do in our environment, it is acceptable and must be acceptable across the European Union which is really a big benefit for our services and definitely for our service customers. Uh, then we already use, as, as we have a common supervision rules, we already have integration with three different certification authorities or, or trust services based on whose capability of identifying their customers, we can identify new customers to ourselves. So we have this kind of an interconnection with, with the other trust service providers because we are in the same legal environment and we can trust each other to do the job well. And this is already like working in a trust services business. And yeah, we have uh, like over 120 services integrated. Uh, just a very quick picture as a last thing uh, here. Where are those services and what are the transactions? I think last, uh, like, the number this week is roughly that across three countries in a single day, like two million pe people or two million transactions are made by those people who are listed there. The, these numbers are coming from March. Uh, so, so we already have like a identity scheme, signature scheme that works in three countries. We hope that these kind of schemes will be like in the market more and more uh, as the years go by. The ADAS inherently wants the Europe to have those and the Europeans to actually move within the European Union in a digital single market and buy and sell and grow their businesses. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Did I make it? <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> for your presentation as well. And seriously, um, I didn't even know there was so much behind your signature. So I think you, you gave us an insight into the broad world of what signatures uh, have to offer. Perhaps a question to you with regard to the future of signatures. Um, do you think there's still room for signatures in the future? Because with a lot of biomedical data, eye scanning, for example, um, don't signatures then become obsolete in the future? No, <laughs> very easily. No, the the kind of if we talk about the biometrics and and the kind of uh, I don't know, a a claim being biometrically maybe confirmed in a single system, maybe then put into the blockchain, then you would have maybe a chain of actions that you can prove later on, but it would be dependent on some huge amount of external systems. Why the signature is nice. I can take this one PDF and send with an email to you, and you need PDF reader as an only tool on your side to understand that everything is fine. So I think that as a, as a simple concept, the signature is important in the con context of moving data between systems without agreeing any like data structure. It is unstructured data from one place to another, having this 
amount of unstructured data on the other side, and then understanding that the data itself is valid, although there might be difficulties to read it. Exactly. So do you see also uh, uh, a solution in the blockchain technology to be able to transfer data and signatures from the one person to the other person or from the one organization to the other organization? Blockchain, in essence, is a tool to guarantee integrity of data. SK has blocked or, or like chain log of, of transactions of their customers since 2002. So yeah, I do believe that there is a kind of a chaining uh, uh, solutions place in the world, but I think that they are really good for integrity. If you have a problem of data integrity, blockchain is cool. Anything else you try to do with that, it fails. Thank you for that. There's uh, a question. There's a question. OK, that's great. Let me see if we have a Maybe you can microphone. ask and I will repeat. If not, could you step forward and I'll give you my microphone <laughs> and you can pose okay. the question. Okay, my name is Kestudis. I'm a founder of digitaldemocracy.io. Uh, so for the last couple of months, I was fighting with Lithuanian Center of Registers, the government, to explain them that the banks are good in the business and the government is failing there. The main issue is that we have in Lithuania mobile signature, which is easy, everybody can do it, and we have USB signature. So the banks, what they did that, you plug in USB and uh, it's immediately the text there and you can log into your bank. Well, the government thinks like when you have to sign documents, go open the company, they try to have a software installed in your computer that tries to copy the signature from USB device and the new Windows is like blocking all this. And like I was explaining to them that this is wrong, you have to follow the banks and it's very really hard to confess. I'm not even sure how, how, how this is going internationally. And our government does not even like the idea of the foreign companies uh, who has like a signature systems in Spain uh, it, to have that signature somewhere else or like already installed in computer or something because then it's not uh, qual it's qualified, but not like uh, so. It, it means you cannot open the company. You just can give that for a friend. So my idea, like, do you think that uh, or you believe that uh, your system is suitable for USB uh, devices for the signatures? And do you think that it's best to have the signature inside device so that uh, the computer software should not try to copy the the signature instead of uh, to try to, to log into the system? So you think that the the signature it should be in the USB device without like thinking out of it, right? Uh, try to understand now the uh, question and, and, and to ask you very quickly. So the uh, problem with USB, USB is one type of gadget. As I said, we are dealing technically with the issue that we are bad calculators and we should move the calculation to some device. So USB stick can be this kind of device. In a smart ID case, your smartphone is the device that does the calculations. What we did with the smart ID, we did really think that we already have very powerful calculators, uh, everybody, and we don't need to give you another one. And we tried to manage that. And I think that what, what happens in everywhere almost in Europe, I think that everybody's moving away from those separate gadgets because it's very hard to sell that to customers. So people are not very eager to go and get new tokens on a daily basis. So they, they would like to do stuff with their phones, and we have to adopt to that. So we have done that uh, in Europe, I think, now for the last 10 years, that we have tried to move to the place where we don't need to have those USB sticks and USB-based devices. But they are still secure and good if they work for you. I don't like to say that they are bad, in essence. So th for me, anything that works for you as, uh, from the user experience point of view is good. But the thing that you explained is that if the user experience is not good, then actually the device doesn't work. It doesn't matter if it's secure or not. Okay. Thank you for that. And is there any further questions? Um, I'm yeah. sure you'll be around be uh, today. Thank you so much. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, a big hand to Kalev. <laughs>